Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today we welcome Sidira Stone. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books and brews. And that means welcome everybody to episode 34 of the Books and Brews podcast. Um, one of these days, I'm just going to remember and not have to look and see what, what we're on now. It's just, there have been so many of them, it's getting hard to hard right. to track. That's a good thing. That's a good problem to have. It is a good problem to have. Um, yeah, so how's your what have you been, been up to? Um, well, it's been Christmas, it's been New Year's, I've been extremely busy, you know, I've had my kids up here. Um, we went out for New Year's Eve, which was like a first in a long time. I've been watching wow. my, uh, my youngest son has taken up wrestling. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say taken it up. He's done a, on and off for like four or five years. But so I've been watching him pin his opponents like 31 seconds, uh, 29 seconds, some pretty amazing times. Wow. That and is then... Yeah. And then we got what's called an arrow garden. Have you ever heard of hydroponic gardening? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got Chris a big one for Christmas. And so we've been filming the plants, taking pictures every day, sometimes every few hours because they're growing <laughs> so fast. So I'm going to put that together in a time lapse um, sequence for I told you we had started our um, blog, not our blog, but our YouTube channel, uh, Wordsmiths and the Wolfhound. Yeah. And so that's going to be one of our videos as a time lapse to see these plants and how fast they're growing. So, cool. What plants? Well, let's see. I got the garden kit. So I've got like, uh, I think six, three or six kinds of lettuce. So like some kind of red lettuce and I don't know if it's romaine or bib or what. And I've got mm -hmm. some herbs in there. So I think, I think dill is in there. I forgot what other there, there's some kinds of some, herbs that I've never even heard of, or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's just like a common one, but it's the type, the specific type. So, yeah. um, and then we have tomatoes. So like, um, some, some kind of Roma tomatoes or some of the smaller ones. So we'll have nice. a whole bunch of that. Yeah. I would love to grow lettuce, but I, I don't have the hydroponic garden. Uh, so I can only grow it outside in the garden and here in Minnesota, the, it, the growing season starts so late. Yeah. And then it gets hot so fast mm -hmm. that by the time the lettuce gets big enough to harvest, it's already too hot and it's getting bitter. Right. So I don't right. even bother. Um, I, I highly recommend this. You know, it's and you can get small ones that go on the countertop. I got one that stands like maybe um, four, four and a half feet tall. And it's what is that? Maybe about two feet wide or something, two and a half mm -hmm. feet wide. And so we have 24 little pods in there of salads, herbs, and tomatoes. So it should produce a good amount. And we're thinking about getting a few so that we can stagger it. So every couple of weeks we start a new batch so that we always have fresh produce. Nice. Yeah. How about that you? Sounds like fun. Um, uh, same thing, holiday. Uh, the biggest news though is yesterday I bought a new banjo. Fantastic. And guess oh. what? Our guest today plays ukulele. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we can form a band here. That's Everybody right. grab an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's skip the interview and just play music. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. I've played it yesterday and today. Mm -hmm. um, it weighs a ton. Really? Like so much more than my old cheap one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's crazy how heavy it is. <laughs> Um, but is it a different material or why is that like heavier wood? Heavier wood, uh, more metal. Okay. Um, everything about it is chunkier. Uh-huh. Does um, it play more easily, more freely? It plays, so it's very different. So there's a lot of getting used to it. So I just emailed a question to my banjo teacher mm -hmm. right before we went on. Um, and it's, I said, 
it's simultaneously easier and harder to play. <laughs> <laughs> certain yeah. things are easier and certain things are, are at this point more difficult, but I think it's just like, because it feels so different than, than mine. I'm just, just gonna be getting used to it. What, what things are harder? Um, well, so a banjo has a resonator on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a big bowl on the back of it. Mm -hmm bounce the sound out and because banjos are so loud uh, I took the resonator off of my old one mm -hmm. um, you you realize you're talking to a trombonist and so I know. <laughs> as loud. I'm like really I bet I could I bet I could blow you your sound away with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's on it's on we're, we're gonna do this. <laughs> but so I took the resonator off and this one uh -huh. has a resonator of course and, okay uh, so now it just sits, the strings are so much further away from my body than I'm used to. So I'm having to refigure out how to hold my right hand. Yeah, it's, I, I got a new flute maybe about nine months ago. And yeah, it's, it, the difference isn't quite as much, but it was so much easier to play. And in theory, mm -hmm. a flute is a flute, but it has a gold plate lip. And um, who knows why, but that seemed to make it easier for me. So when I was in the in the shop buying the thing, trying the thing out, uh, the shopkeeper asked me, "So what have you been playing?" Mm -hmm. I said, "Oh, I don't even know. It's a hundred and fifty dollar banjo." <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> he goes, "Oh, well, oh. this is uh, several magnitudes of a step mm -hmm. up." <laughs> from yeah, that's that. pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So did you get some reading in? No. No. <laughs> well, um, if, if I can count my own writing, I've read, uh, let's see, I think I told you last month at our last interview that I had released my book, Tales from Beyond Our World. Did I tell mm -hmm. you that? I, th I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe. Okay. Um, sure well, did. I did. So yeah, I've, I've been, uh, you know, reading and editing that. I've been reading and uh, as I write, Chris and I started a long time ago a book called Saint in the Cellar. And this is funny. It started when we looked at this amazing house on Summit Hill that we were actually thinking of buying. And all of a sudden we're in this like plant room in the basement and there's this window that opens and there's a grate and there's this room. And it made us think, have you ever heard of anchorites? Huh. Um, they, in the medieval times, these were um, usually women, but some men too. And they would have themselves sealed into a room that was attached to the outside of a church. So they could look into the church for mass and they could look outside to talk to the people in the town. And the point was that they lived there and they spent their day praying and, you know, attending mass and then counseling people who came to their window in, in the town street. And so we looked at this and we thought that looks like an anchorite cell. And so we came up with this story about this little boy who moves into this house and discovers there is a saint in the cellar. And so that's, that's been really fun. We started that like five years ago and I'm finally having time to get back to it. Wow. So that's, that's a, my reading for this month. Yeah. Sounds like a fun read. Um, it's, it's going to be a book where you never really know. This is a boy who has a lot of imaginary friends and in theory, the reader is never really going to be sure, was he seeing someone in this room in the basement or wasn't he? So um, I'm looking forward to having it done. Okay. Who's our guest? Well, our guest today, hopefully I'm saying your name right, Sidira, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. All right. So Sidira Stone is an award-winning contemporary romance author she spins steamy, smoochy tales set in small businesses, a quirky bookstore, a neighborhood bar, a vintage boutique. Her stories highlight found family, friendship, and the sizzling chemistry that pulls unlikely partners together. When she emerges from her writing cave in Las Vegas, Nevada, which she seldom does, uh, except right now we have her, she can be found in belly dance class or strumming her ukulele, perhaps exploring the West with her charming husband or cooking up a storm and always gobbling all the romance books. Sidira's promise to readers a guaranteed happily ever after and no cliffhangers. Hey, cliffhangers. Hate them. <laughs> <laughs> so just yeah, that's good. define I hate cliffhangers. What, what would you consider a cliffhanger? Like that the book ends with no 
really without resolving the the main conflict without answering um or delivering on the the promise of the story Mm -hmm. for example in um in a lot of genres not typically romance but say you know an adventure series or a Mm sci-fi series or fantasy series you've got that overarching big bad Mm -hmm. and the characters don't uh actually resolve that conflict until the very end of the series but within each episode you expect the main conflict of that of that book to be resolved in a satisfying way and in romance especially that is the promise of the premise in romance Mm -hmm. you're going to get that um that hea that happily ever after and you romance readers expect that you know not delivering on that and saying you know oh and then on the final page she's kidnapped and if you want to know what happens by the next book in the series i just i feel so manipulated so before we go on to beer number one, I should explain my background here today. Um, I thought since this will go live in February, I, I would put on all my red and my red earrings. And I thought, you know, we've we've been playing around with different backgrounds. We still have our Christmas tree up, but that didn't seem right for February. So I thought, well, we'll use the Zoom background and put up hearts. And then I looked at pictures and went, that would look really stupid. So what's the (laughs) next romantic thing? A castle. So this is actually the interior of Smailholm Castle. And so last night for the um, Wordsmiths and Wolfhound uh, podcast, whatever you want to call it, that Chris and I did last night, we talked about a book called In the Keep of Time that's set in Smailholm Castle. And it was a place where back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, couples would go all the way up the stairs. It was completely empty inside at the time, like no floors, but they would climb up these stairs to the roof, four stories up, and they would sit on the roof. And that's where couples would court in Scotland, oh, cool. in Kelso, Scotland in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So I thought that was really appropriate for a Valentine's episode. Very cool. Nice. Yeah. Before I moved back to the U.S. in 14, Mm -hmm. I lived for a very long time in Germany. And the last town I lived in was in uh, um, Mm Rheinland-Pfalz, in that little western bit of Germany that pokes up against uh, the Netherlands and Belgium and France Mm -hmm. and um, Luxembourg. And we lived right across a a small river from a 10th century castle. The oldest bit was 10th century. Uh-huh. And uh, so, uh, yeah, there, this kind of reminds me of the interior. Of course, you know, uh-huh. stone castles look like oh. stone castles. And but I, uh, I love with stone castles. So what's yeah. beer number one? What is beer number one? So first of all, let me say, Sadira, that uh, oftentimes when I get the readings, uh, I read them and I go, this is not speaking to me, beer wise. <laughs> Yours were super easy. <laughs> Story takes place in a neighborhood bar. <laughs> takes place in a neighborhood bar in a beer mecca of the U.S. Oh yeah. So it's like, oh, this is this is super simple. I got this, um, and I, I I'm gonna guess from reading that you might be a beer fan. I love a good craft beer. Okay, good. Um, so first beer is uh, Bell's Amber Ale. Uh, I chose this because Mac and Jack's. Amber Ale features prominently in this first reading. Um, It's mentioned more than once. And uh, we, of course, can't. So obviously, you got to go with what's in the story. It's the the no brainer pairing. Uh, But we can't get Mac and Jack's Amber Ale here. But Mac and Jack's Amber Ale is a good uh, regional Amber Ale. So I thought I would go with a good regional Amber Ale that we can get here. So this is Bells from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, and it's just a really nice amber ale, nice caramel malty, um, some light citrusy hops over the top and a little bit of bitterness. It's, it's a beer that I really like. Uh, I think you'll like this one, Laura. Okay. Chris promised me I'm going to hate all three of them. So oh, I think you'll like this one. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cost. Um, Remember the time I said of that one beer, it's kind of like the Eco Nokia Sherry. Did I say that right? Yeah. It tastes kind of weird, but I want some more. <laughs> All right, good. Because <laughs> it's mostly beer. malty and you like the malty beers. It's, it's tart. Um, I think I would especially like this on a summer day, like a very it's hot summer day. This would tart. be really it refreshing. Not be tart. Well, maybe that's not quite the right word. It's, 
it's definitely got a little bit of a kind of bite to it, I think. It's got, it's, you know, it, medium bitterness. Let's call it medium bitterness. Okay, maybe and then some, is some kind of citrusy word. hops and, and there's some, I think, fermentation fruit in there as well. I enjoy hearing you talk about this because then I'm tasting it, actually trying to taste what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I love yeah. a good amber ale. I wrote, wrote a piece long, long, long time ago because people often trash on amber ales as being boring beers. <laughs> so I wrote a piece long ago say, that I had a confession to make. I like boring beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes and that's... I just, I love a good amber ale. Mm -hmm. So, if you like cheers. Taste, oh, we already said cheers. cheers. But... Yeah, cheers again. So, Sadira, <laughs> we are on reading number one, Christmas Rekindled, Bangers Tavern Romance, book one. Yes. Okay, and this bit is... Um, told from the point of view of Charlie Puri. She uh, worked in Bangor's Tavern, which is located on, um, a, in a really interesting district, a real life district called the Sixth Avenue District on Sixth Avenue, obviously. And it's full of all kinds of funky bars and restaurants and a whole lot of record shops. If you're a fan of vinyl, it's a good place to be. And uh, cannabis dispensaries and vintage shops of them with all kinds of funky clothing and collectibles and it's just a really neat place and uh, she comes back into town to take care of her estranged father Jack Curry who was who had his leg badly smashed up in a in an accident on the job um she's not looking forward to spending the holidays in Tacoma and uh she is uh, heading out to blow off some steam at this favorite old hangout of hers where she once worked called Bangers Tavern, so named because it used to be an English style pub famous for its bangers and mash. Hmm. And if people want to do other things with their imagination with that title, that's not on me. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hands stuffed in her pockets, breath popping like a locomotive, she rounded the corner onto Sixth Avenue, Tacoma's 16 block stretch of night spots, vintage clothing boutiques, record shops, restaurants, and cannabis dispensaries. The yeasty, sugary scent wafting from legendary donuts almost lured her in, but she craved a different treat, a fat, juicy, grease dripping down your elbows burger topped with crispy fried onions and melty cheese curds with a side of the crunchiest, goldenest tater tots this side of the Cascades washed down with a Mac and Jack's African amber. Hopefully Dawn would be working tonight, how long since she last saw her old boss and surrogate mom? One year? Two? Charlie's cheeks heated with shame. She stepped around, a grizzled old dude shouting slurred curses at an invisible foe, demurred when another wide, wild-eyed guy offered her some choice indica bud, and gave a wide berth to the boisterous dude bros smoking outside jazz knuckles. Fairy lights and glitter snowflakes twinkled from the wedding gown resale boutique, and a plastic Santa holding a fat joint grinned from a record shop's window. She grinned back at him. The businesses on the Ave might change, but the funky vibe stayed the same. Even on a Tuesday night, this street was packed with fun seekers, street people, and college kids from nearby Puget Sound University, her alma mater. Her wide smile widened when she reached Bangers and inhaled the tempting odor of greasy bar snacks. The bouncer was new, big as a mountain with a shaved head and a sweet baby face. He checked her ID, then motioned her through. She stopped in the doorway and let the familiar sights, sounds, and smells transport her back to her college years, where she spent most nights here schlepping beers and burgers. Same wooden bar, dents and cigarette burns preserved under a layer of shiny varnish. Same neon beer signs, same beer coasters and beer ads covering the walls, same TVs broadcasting a hodgepodge of sports, not that anyone was paying attention. Nothing had changed. After all, why mess with perfection? Same noisy, eclectic crowd, too. Snarky old farts hunched over their beers at the bar, frat boys with popped collars, sharp-eyed pool sharks. Way in back, rowdy dart players hooted over good scores and bad ones. Gum-chomping servers wove through the crowd, trays held high, keeping customers well-watered. Charlie inhaled deeply and grinned. 
good to be home. She plunged into the crowd, jabbing with her elbows when needed. At five foot two, she was easy to overlook, but only once. Damned if she was going to let some bulky behemoth step on her toes. Coming through. Watch yourself, Bubba. She skirted guffawing college kids in PSU lumberjack hoodies and climbed onto a bar stool. The lone bartender's long braids flew as she spun from the taps to the counter and back, moving with amazing speed. But Charlie knew from years of experience it'd be a while before she got something to quench her thirst. The place was slammed. A woman wearing a Seattle Mariner's ball cap atop short gray curls emerged from swinging doors behind the bar, patted the petite bartender's shoulder, and started filling beer glasses. She chopped off her dreadlocks and grown a little wider across the seat, but there was no mistaking that mischievous grin, those tawny, freckle-dusted cheeks. Charlie felt her heart swell in her chest. Dawn was still here. From the bar stool at the end of the bar, a gruff geezer hollered, Man, I could die of thirst in this joint. Another familiar face. What's his name again? Keep your pants on. Dawn turned, foam-topped beer in hand, and froze. Her plump face lit up like Christmas. Charlie? The thirsty man grumbled, and Dawn slammed his beer in front of him, sloshing a quarter of its contents onto the bar. Shut your yap, Gus. Don't you recognize your old friend? Gus squinted at her, then at Dawn. With a shrug, he slurped his beer. Dawn leaned her elbows on the counter. Too pickled to remember much. Been coming here for 20 years, and last week you called me Donna. She pinched Charlie's cheek. Good to see you, Angel. Thought you were living in Portland now. What brings you back? Dad broke his leg on the job. Nasty crash. My sister watches him nights, and I've got the day shift. Without asking, Dawn handed Charlie a Mac and Jacks, her favorite. You still doing that computer stuff? Web design and maintenance. It's portable, so. She shrugged and sipped her beer. Say, do you still serve that burger with the fried onion rings? Sure thing, doll. We slammed, though, so it'll take a while. Don snatched a packet of pork rinds from the rack behind the bar. This will keep you alive. I'll tell Diego to put a rush on it. Diego's still here? She tore open the packet and stuffed a handful of crunchy porky delight into her mouth. Best fry cook on the Ave. I'm lucky he hasn't moved on to one of those fancy new places, Don said over her shoulder as she pulled more beers. It's not easy to keep good people. And now Carla, my head server, is back in Minnesota for the holidays. Her mom is sick. Might be her last Christmas, so I couldn't say no. An idea tickled the back of Charlie's brain. Hardly any of her college friends still lived in Tacoma. And these past few days cooped up with dad had her itching for some lively company. If she could still rake in tips like she used to, she'd easily earn enough to go skiing in January. How long will she be gone? Carla? Till January. Dawn's sharp brown eyes narrowed. Why? All her best decisions in life have been made quickly, a matter of trusting her gut. And right now her guttometer buzzed and flashed like a slot machine. She pasted on a confident grin. Because I'm stuck here caring for dad for at least that long, might as well earn a few bucks on the side. You know I can handle the job. What do you say? Well, now. Don slapped her towel onto the bar and grinned. Looks like my Christmas wish has been granted. A bell behind her dinged and a rimming plate appeared on the pass-through window. She set the plate in front of Charlie. On the house. When can you start? As Soon as I finish this. She lifted the burger, a real jaw stretcher, and took a bite of cheesy, beefy, crisp onion, fluffy bun heaven. Diego's special sauce oozed out the side and dripped onto her tots. I'll get the paperwork. As she headed toward her office and back, Don nudged the bartender. Kiara, say hi to Charlie. She's going to step in for Carla. Kiara flashed a bright smile. Howdy, Charlie. Is it Charlene? Charlotte. She popped a tot into her mouth just as crispy as she remembered. I'd shake your hand, but she waved her greasy fingers. You all alone back there? The bartender rolled her eyes. River's late, again. If you weren't so charming, Don would have canned his butt long ago. Oh, oh, charming, am I? A deep baritone voice at her elbow spun Charlie around, but the guy had already slid behind the bar. Tall, blonde, broad shoulders beneath a crisp black shirt, Lean but muscular, more like a dancer than a football player. 
His hair flopped into his eyes as he bent to scrub his hands. His short golden beard framed plush lips. Mismatched earrings, a small oval onyx on the left, a silver anchor on the right, thick brown lashes. Blue eyes, I'll bet. Breath held, Charlie waited. Greenish hazel with flecks of amber. His gaze flicked up and held hers for a moment that seemed to stretch on and on. Then those bright eyes scanned her from top to bottom. One eyebrow flicked up and his lips spread in a devilish smile. Hello, new girl. Happy little fireflies danced in her stomach. Words stuck in her throat. Not so new, Don smacked a stack of papers onto the bar. Totally focused on pretty boy's dazzling smile, Charlie hadn't seen her old new boss approach. She took the pen Don proffered, cleared her throat, and began scribbling her contact information. Charlie used to work here about, what was it, hon? I uh, started in 09, I think, and I left in 14. In an instant, River's expression shuddered. Brows lowered, eyes narrowed, lips clamped in a tight straight line. He picked up a bar towel, flung it over his shoulder, and silently turned to the beer taps. Don scowled and elbowed him. Don't be rude, River. Say hello to Charlie. She's taken over for Carla. Hello, Charlie. His voice dripped icicles. Kiara hip bumped him. Be nice, River. Who pissed in your Cheerios? Without further comment, he moved to the far end of the bar where a gaggle of college age girls awaited refreshment. While River greeted them, they erupted in giggles. His high wattage smile reappeared as he muddled mint and cucumber in tall glasses, his forearm muscles flexing beneath tight sleeves. Kiara leaned on the bar and sighed. Be a lady killer, that one. Earns more in tips than the rest of us combined. I feel sorry for his girlfriend. Charlie tilted her head toward the too pretty jerk. Oh, he doesn't. Enough gossip. Don shooed Kiara away, then leaned closer. Sorry, kiddo. Riff is usually such a charmer. I'll have a word with him. No worries, boss. I don't need to join his fan club to work here. She tilted her chin toward the end of the bar where River whipped out drinks with impressive speed and flair. And I'll give him a run for his money on those tips. Wow, I'm guessing that there is some history between the two of them. That there is. Remembers. He, yeah, he, he remembers, she does not. I figured she didn't. She has no reaction to that. So um, as long as, what, what drew you to romance? You know, I started out writing um, Cozy Mysteries and really? ended up having to remove a very steamy love scene from uh, the first one that I completed when I realized that Cozy Mystery fans do not want steamy love scenes in their stories mm -hmm. and uh, wrote a couple more. And the, the romance thread was always there, but I, I didn't take the hint. And then one day um, I read an article on how fun and lucrative writing erotic stories can be. Hmm. And I thought, oh, that would be a fun challenge. You know, at the time I was submitting my, uh, my mysteries to agents and getting nicer and nicer, no thank yous, but still mm -hmm. no thank yous, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I gave it a try. And the story that I wrote turned out to want to be a full-fledged romance novel mm -hmm. rather than just uh, a steamy short. And I never had so much fun with a writing project. It just flowed. And, uh, and I ended up finding a publisher for that one mm -hmm. and went on to write three in that series and then another single title. And now I'm working on this series set in a bar in Tacoma, uh, mm -hmm. where I lived until just recently. And yeah, I just love it. Uh, I love the... Just for kick, since this is going to be sort of our Valentine's Day show, what would you consider the most romantic date? Oh, wow. Oh. Apart from a castle, of course. Yeah, the castles are romantic. You know, I think more emotionally touching mm -hmm. than something that took a lot of planning and money mm -hmm. can be a beautiful natural setting. Yep. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And, uh, for example, my husband proposed, uh, when we were on a bench beside, mm -hmm. um, the, the shore down by San Diego and oh, nice. it was a moonlit night and it was very simple and, uh, dunes stretched out in front of us. And I can't picture a more romantic setting than that. So I like to have, uh, couples outdoors. In fact, 
in one of my recent books, I had the couple um, camping under the stars in a little uh, cove mm -hmm. off of the Washington coast. And it, it's based on a real place my husband took me where when the tide comes in, it's you're completely cut off from the rest uh -huh. of the beaches. Cool. But when it goes out, you can you can access this little hollow. And so that was one of the most romantic scenes I've ever written. Ready for Where your stories are set, it's a great time, a great place to put them into the uh, outdoors. <laughs> yeah, the Pacific Northwest is great. I think we're ready for beer number two, Michael. Okay, beer number two. Uh, so last month I poured Grain Belt Premium uh, as one of the three beers. And this week, this month we have the other one, of the Grain Belt's beers, the Grain Belt Northeast. Northeast um, in Minneapolis. So uh, I, again, it's, it's based on this Bangers Tavern. Um, as I was reading the descriptions of it in the various readings, it just reminded me of a Northeast Minneapolis dive bar, uh, which Northeast Minneapolis is famous for its dive bars. They're old taverns that have been there forever, but you know, they're kind of hipster places now. Um, and so uh, I went with Northeast Minneapolis Dive Bar. Uh, Northeast in Minneapolis is called Nordeast. Nordeast. Because we are in the up nord. Right. <laughs> you never um, pronounce the TH. So this is an amber American lager. Um, it's basically a uh, green belt premium with some caramel. <laughs> That's that's exactly what it is. Uh, right. You may or may not care for this one, Laura. I'm oh, guessing right. probably not. So I'm going in. <laughs> I'm not sure I would do that again. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's maltier and more caramely than Grain Belt Premium, but it's still Grain Belt Premium with some caramel. <laughs> Although I have to give you credit, you know, I think like four or five years ago, if someone had given this to me, I probably would have spit it out. Now I'm like. Hmm, hmm, there's some interesting flavors in there. Working on you, working on you slow. I know, bit by bit. Another five years, I might be, you know, a huge fan of beer. I'll say, this okay. is not one of my favorites either, so. Okay, so even the beer aficionados aren't crazy about this, or is that just you? Um, I don't know, probably some are, it's just me. Okay, well, then we're ready for reading number two, and this is from Opposites ignite from bangers tavern romance number two go ahead yes okay after waking up naked and hung over in eddie's bed on new year's day rosie realizes it was a huge mistake to hook up with a co-worker especially one as straight laced and shy as eddie he doesn't see it that way but reluctantly accepts her decision to remain just friends rather than watch rosie walk out his door eddie turned his back and started washing their dirty glasses the front door clicked open and she squeaked like a dog's chew toy. He whirled, Rosie, you okay? She'd frozen in the door frame, clutching her coat to her chest. On the landing stood his grandmother holding a tray. Babka, he rushed to the doorway and stepped in front of Rosie. Hi, uh, what are you? Surprise, Lapachka. With her ample hip, she nudged him aside and strode through the door, a woman on a mission. You missed the big family party in Seattle last night, so Dedke and I came down to toast the new year with you. She set the tray on his kitchen counter and pinched his cheek. My hardworking boy. She leaned past him and winked at Rosie. Always working this one. But I guess you know that, miss. Rosie croaked as if she'd swallowed her tongue. Bobka poked his ribs with her sharp elbow. Why didn't you tell us about your new girlfriend? In his grandparents' old school world, overnight guests equaled serious relationship not one shot misadventure. What a freaking disaster. Bobka, this is Rosie Chu, my friend from work. A truthful statement, sort of. Hopefully he and Rosie could get back to being friends someday once they move past this awkwardness, maybe in a few months when the memories of their dead end passion faded. Right, like that's gonna happen. Bobka flung her arms around Rosie's middle and squeezed tight. Such a gorgeous girl. Welcome to the family, sweetheart. Rosie's mouth opened and closed like a startled goldfish. I, um, her wide-eyed gaze met his over the top of Babka's snow-white head. Please, he silently mouthed, then raised his voice. Rosie was just leaving. 
She has a family thing. Bob could grab Rosie's hand and patted it. Family is so important, especially on the holidays. You're what, Korean? How does your family celebrate the new year, darling? <sighs> Great. Let the interrogation begin. I'm half Chinese, Rosie said, but we just have a normal American brunch. Eggs, hash browns. Bob could give a conspiratorial wink. To tell you the truth, not many of us Volkovs even speak Russian anymore, but we still like our Russian traditions. I made pelmeni, little meat dumplings. Chinese people love dumplings, right? Come, try one before you go. Babka. With a dismissive wave, she quickly stepped to the door. Oh, I almost forgot. She pulled his little moleskin notebook from her shirt pocket. Found this on the landing. Relief duked it out with panic as he tucked the notebook into his pocket. If his sharp-eyed grandmother looked between the covers, she'd have discovered his lists of bar equipment, cocktail recipes, sketches of floor plans. Both of you downstairs, everybody's waiting. Babka's flashed a grin over her shoulder. Hurry up before Dedka gobbles all the herring. The door closed behind her with a bang. Rosie clapped a hand to her mouth. Herring? With sour cream, good for a hangover. She wrinkled her nose. No doubt his grandmother was already telling the rest of the family about his new girlfriend. His single status was the source of much consternation at family gatherings, as if he were nearing his expiration date. He clasped Rosie's arms. Look, I know it's a lot to ask, but could you come down to my parents' house for just a few minutes? When her jaw dropped, he added, they're really old fashioned. If they think I've had a one night stand, they'll be so disappointed in me. Panic forced his rusty brain wheels into motion. Please, Rosie, just let them think we're dating for now. Later, I'll tell them we broke up. Rosie nibbled her bottom lip, a distractingly sexy gesture. Finally, she sighed. Well, I guess I'm partly to blame for this mess. If a few dumplings will get you out of it, I'm game. I liked that ending, you know, that she didn't, she's not too happy with the situation, but she still is caring enough that, that she doesn't put him in an awkward spot. And I was really curious, especially as you read this, do you have some background with Russian heritage? No, actually I have some, um, some relatives on my daughter-in-law's side who are from Latvia. Okay. And that's what they sound like. <laughs> okay. so you're very but yeah, familiar. I like to do accents. Accents are fun. You do them well. So you. um, you write under pseudonyms. Did you write your cozy mysteries? Or I mean, now you're writing under a pseudonym and people right. have reasons for, you know, using their real name, using a pseudonym. What was your reason for going with the pseudonym? Primarily, it's a branding thing. I do plan to eventually... Um, published cozy mysteries too but that's a completely different reading experience and readers have completely different expectations mm -hmm. so if i were to use the same pen name for steamy romances and for not at all steamy cozy mysteries you know mm -hmm. the readers of one would be disappointed when they opened a book under the same name and got something new you right. know i know that's an interesting discussion among authors and i've heard some that just say no i'm going to publish everything under the same name and readers just need to understand this is a different series it's a different genre and mm -hmm. that, that, you know so it's it's an interesting question mm -hmm. among authors you know what how did you get your start in writing oh my gosh um i recall doing lengthy epic batman fan fiction when i was in maybe the fourth or fifth grade and we're talking adam west batman and i invented and inserted my own characters and, uh -huh. Yeah, uh, I've been a spinner of stories to entertain myself since I was very small. I was one of those bookish kids. Yeah. And yeah, I think it's a natural leap. If you love to read stories all the time, of course, you're going to want to make some of your own. Right, right. And that's true for me, too. You know, in fact, the book Chris and I were talking about just last <laughs> night on our program is a huge motivation what started my own series. So, mm -hmm. and Michael, we're ready for beer number three already goes fast. Gosh, it does go fast. Uh, so beer number three is Dale's Pale Ale from uh, Longmont, Colorado. Uh, I chose this beer because featured prominently in this last reading is uh, a, a plate of loaded tater tots. Uh, and it's mentioned in the, in the reading uh, that it goes really well with an amber ale. So we're talking beer and food pairings. 
already. We already have an amber ale, so I couldn't do another amber ale. So I had to think, well, what would I pair with this? Um, you know, it, it's there's a lot going on in this dish of tater tots. Uh, it's probably kind of rich and heavy, and you're going to want something with a little bit of hops to cut through it. Uh, but you're also going to want something with a little bit of malt to latch on to the, the brown crispiness of the tater tots. So I chose um, American Pale Ale. Plenty of hops to, to cleanse your palate of all the, the goo and grease from the <laughs> tater tots. Uh, but a little bit of malt underneath to, to pair with the, the Maillard reaction of the fried tots. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to like this one, Laura. <laughs> But it's Aww. it's not it's not super aggressively hoppy, so you but, won't. But look at maybe that! Um, I'm going to have a really nice mustache by the time I get to the beer. <laughs> All right, cheers. Cheers. I'm curious: Are uh, bars in the Twin Cities area as fond of tater tots as they are in Tacoma, Washington? Oh yes. I mean, we in Minnesota, we claim Minnesota. the tater tot as ours. My <laughs> Minnesota hot dish, yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, I was hungry by the time I finished reading this scene. <laughs> <laughs> Said I got to make me some of those. Uh, go ahead. I, I don't have it written down here. What is the name of this reading? This is from Delicious Heat Bangers Tavern Romance 3, which uh, released today. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Dawn poked her head into the kitchen again near closing time. Diego, I need a super deluxe tots plate to go. Prado. She waggled her eyebrows. Our spy did an excellent job. When the tots were crispy and golden, Diego layered on the toppings, shredded extra sharp tillum of cheddar, crumbled pepper bacon, paper thin slices of green onion, garlicky sauteed mushrooms, pickled sweet hot pepper slices, sour cream, and a drizzle of his housemade spicy ketchup. Heart attack on a plate. He hoped Charlie's sister was hungry. Was she as pretty as Charlie? He smoothed his apron, blotted his sweaty forehead, and told Shelby, be right back. At the bar, he found bartenders Kiara and River, along with all three servers, huddled around a brunette knockout in a curve-skimming red dress. She glanced up. Their gazes met and held. Everything else slowed down. Those last few steps to the bar felt like being towed through honey. Her espresso dark eyes widened, sparkling under the Christmas lights. Her plump lips parted. Her chest rose and fell. She's a goddess. He set the tots before her, removed his cap, and scrubbed a hand through his squashed hair. She echoed the gesture, winding a chestnut curl around her slender fingers. Abuelita had told him the story of when she and Abuelo first met. It was like a golden rope wrapped around my heart and pulled me to him. It holds us together still. At the time, he'd laughed off her hyperbole, but now, in this electric moment, Diego understood exactly what she meant. Hi, the angel murmured, her voice low and musical like a cello. Did you make these? Dumbstruck by her beauty, he could only nod. She lifted a tot to her lips, inhaled the steam rolling off it, and sighed. He thanked the kitchen gods for the apron hiding the evidence of his attraction. She took a bite, then her head lolled back on a groan. So good. Charlie narrowed her eyes and moved closer to her sister, bristling with protective vibes. Couldn't blame her. He'd do the same if someone was eyeing his little sister like a tasty snack. Say something, idiot. He cleared his throat. They go uh, really well with the Port Angeles Amber. He hooked a thumb over his shoulder toward the beer taps. Her gaze dropped and the corner of her mouth hit up in a hot, shy half smile. Wish I could try it, but I'm pregnant. No ring on her left hand, but a pale indentation where one had recently been. Divorced? Please let her be single. Please, please, please. Oh, well, then enjoy, Miss Anna. Though it didn't seem possible, her wide smile made her even more beautiful. Flushed and breathless, he backed toward the kitchen and bonked into something soft. Watch where you're going, Romeo. With a chuckle, Don grasped his shoulders, spun him around, and sent him on his way with a gentle shove. What are you doing? His common sense shrieked. She's pregnant. 
but he allowed himself a final glance over his shoulder. Anna popped another tot into her lush mouth and winked. Waggling his fingers, he pushed through the swinging doors and then collapsed against the wall, clutching his heart. What's the matter with you? Shelby asked with a snort. He closed his eyes and heaved a heavy sigh. I just met the woman I'm going to marry. Um, great ending. So as I said, I got hungry just listening to that. And I was curious, is that actually what they serve in this particular bar that this is based on? Um, this is a, an amalgam of several bars. Okay. Um, and I have had some pretty amazing loaded tots, but yeah, that's pretty much the figure of my imagination. Looking at, okay. I looked at so many tot recipes <laughs> while writing this series. Isn't it funny the things we end up researching when we're writing? Oh, I, yeah. I once spent, I think, a day and a half trying to figure out when buttons actually came you know, onto the scene in clothing and found out it was so close to the time I was writing, but there were not buttons in the time I'm writing in. Um, but it took some work to find wow. out that little tiny detail. Huh. So, um, and I am going to make tots with everything you described on there. <laughs> so um, I'm curious, you know, when I read this, do you believe in love at first sight or do you think that would- No, I do <laughs> not. I do not. I believe in strong attraction at first sight, mm -hmm. but that's no guarantee that that two people have what it takes to really connect on a deep level. Love is about really knowing somebody down to the marrow of their bones. And that takes time to develop. Right, right. So the second half of my question was actually, or do you believe that there are sometimes people who have this immediate attraction and they're just lucky that it does grow into real love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that's more what you see it as. Um, you also have a series set in a bookstore, and is that based on a real bookstore? No, again, that's that's a combination of many, many bookstores I've known and loved. Because you know, what writer or or avid reader hasn't wanted a bookshop of their own? Right, right. Um, and it's a very interesting bookstore. Um, has a little bit of the secret. So, what are some of your biggest influences and inspirations in writing? Oh, wow. You know, I was, an, I was a high school English teacher for many years. And after 27 years of teaching serious literature with a capital L, you know, um, uh, I, I love books that are joyful, even though, of course, we want them to have some real gut-wrenching moments where, where we think everything is lost. Um, and I, I had to teach so many stories and plays and novels that just ended with so much doom so many war-based stories that it is I seek out now stories that have delight and that are uplifting and I'm not talking about sappy hallmark kind of stories mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of of those kinds of you know they strike me as kind of flat and mm -hmm. and the characters are a little too Pollyannish and perfect Yes. To, to relate to. I like stories with a lot of humor. Um, one author I read for years before I took the leap into romance was um, Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum oh, I like her. series. I love those. Yes, and I also like Sue Grafton's uh, mysteries. And I love the combination of humor and the dark side of human experience. I love the colorful characters that both of those authors assemble in their series. And I love the found family aspects mm -hmm. of those two long running series. Um, another favorite mystery writer of mine is J.A. Jantz. Mm -hmm. um, her series with uh, Sheriff Joanna Brady of Cochise County, Arizona, mm -hmm. has, also has that found family and some just good humor and a lot of dark, of course, because it's about murder. Um, I try to work in that found family and that humor, but also the, the family strife into my stories as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that keeps it very real. So um, I did read in one of your interviews that you said in part you're inspired by women you know, and you want to give them the happy ever after that they deserve. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious, would do these women know that you based a character on them? Or would they recognize themselves? No, because again, these are amalgams of mm -hmm. lots of real people I've known. And you take their, the, you know, the flamboyance of this one and the 
huge heartedness of that one and the irreverent humor and you mix them all together and you get, for example, Don O'Malley, who runs Bangor's Tavern. Mm -hmm. So what do you like the most about writing? Wow. Uh, good reviews. <laughs> no, I'm, what I love most is when you hit the zone, and I'm sure as a writer, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where mm -hmm. it's like the characters are dictating. For me, it's like I'm watching it on a mental screen. For me, it's a very mm -hmm. visual process, and yes. the scene unfolds, and my fingers are just racing to keep up. Yes, yes, I love that feeling. There was a night, um, now this is going back, you know, oh, 30 years, and um, this was when I was very young, first married, I had a couple of little kids, and we had taken a walk-in closet and turned it into my office and the apartment we had, and I went in there at eight o'clock at night, and I thought I wrote for about 20, 30 minutes, and I came out, and it was like two in the morning. Wow. That was like a writer's dream, I know. <laughs> yeah the greatest thing yeah um so last question what would be some of your best advice to aspiring writers get other people's eyeballs on your story before you put it out there in the world and and especially people who know and love the genre that you're writing mm -hmm. and if you're not sure what genre you're writing then you might want to start with a with a general critique group and they're not hard to find just go to meetup.com put in your area writers groups and you'll find them mm -hmm. but the best feedback I've ever gotten was from other writers in the genre so if I'm working on a mystery I go to other mystery writers and mm -hmm. uh, if I and and if you can't get writers at least you know extreme mystery fans people who know and love that genre um, the advice that I've got from you know, uh, one of my recent critique groups had um, this wonderful guy who wouldn't touch a, a romance with pole mm -hmm. if it were not for the fact that I was sitting there right next to him. And his feedback, unfortunately, wasn't very helpful, mm -hmm. you know, because he you need someone who knows the expectations of the kind of story you're writing, be it, you know, urban fantasy, post-apocalyptic, sci-fi, whatever you love, find mm -hmm. other people who love those kinds of stories. That's very good advice. And that's usually my advice too. The number one thing is get a good writer's group. Now, I do know that some writer's groups, you know, I've, I've had friends actually in my writer's group that I was part of until I left Minneapolis um, who said he had stumbled into some where the goal seemed to be to tear everybody else down to prove that you're the best writer. You know, and I, so he'd run into a couple of groups that just weren't good. So they're not all great. Yeah. And you might have to look a few times, but I lucked out and my group was great. I was with Night Writers for probably 14, 15 years before, um, you know, we've had a rocky last couple of years for obvious reasons. So um, what is next for you? You've just put a book out. So are you already working on the next one? I am. Uh, the, the next in the series, possibly the last, but we'll see, is uh, Jojo the Bouncer and Lana. Uh, who is taking care of their two teen brothers after having lost their parents in a car accident. And the family would like to pull those boys apart because the Tias, they know how to raise teen boys. Mm -hmm. and they don't approve of her methods. So uh, that'll be the last, possibly the last Bangers Tavern. And well, uh, then I'm going to start a nice new thing. series. Right. Yeah. You, you don't need to stop at book four with that kind of a series. You know, you can yeah. pick it up again any time. So um, where can readers find you? My website is sadirastone.com, one word. Will you and uh, yep, S-A-D-I-R-A, -A, like sad, Ira, sad Ira stone, stone, like a rock, okay. dot com. And uh, I'm on Twitter, Sadira Stone. I'm on Facebook, Sadira Stone. I'm on uh, Instagram. I haven't tried TikTok. And <laughs> yeah, and uh, all, all the places where all the socials. And I have some disorganized Pinterest. You can find me there and find the <laughs> pictures of my characters. That's neat. Um, and I never think to add my Pinterest account when we're giving our links. Michael, where can we, where can readers find or listeners find us and you? I am at aperfectpint.net and aperfectpint on the socials. We are at booksandbrews.net and Book and Brews on Instagram, Books and Brews with Laura Bosica and Michael Agnew on Facebook. 
Uh, where are you, Laura? Yeah. Well, and we have our YouTube channel. You just have oh, we have our YouTube. Videos. I always forget the YouTube channel. Yeah, you know, and I never think to add that in. And so you do need to put, um, oops, my musical clocks are going off. Can you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got like, I think maybe about two dozen clocks and probably a dozen of them all make their chimes about oh, wow. on the hour. Um, but they're not all synced, so they don't go off at once. It just kind of continues for about five minutes with different clocks. So um, I'm a musician. I have to have musical clocks. So um, I am at uh, lauravosica.com or bluebellschronicles.com. They both go to the same site. Um, you can find, actually, some more information about me and Chris at chrisandlaurapowell.com. And I'm on Facebook, Laura.Bosica.Author, and I'm on Twitter, just as my publishing company, Gabriel Sworn. Um, I don't even know what that is. It's like GBNS, BKS, or something like that, um, because Gabriel Sworn wasn't available. So, and then we also have our YouTube channel, Wordsmiths and the Wolfhound. Again, you just have to put that in and search. And we've been having a lot of fun. I wanted to ask you about your cooking, Sadira, but the time's up. Um, you might enjoy a few of our posts on there, our videos, because we've been doing some medieval cooking out of a cookbook Ooh. I put out, or not a cookbook as I call it, because it's also history and songs and things. Um, explaining the history behind my books. So we did a medieval steak pie the other day. Um, I'm trying to remember what else we did. We've we've done two or three and we're doing one called Leche's Fries. We don't even know how to pronounce it. That calls for almond milk and raisins and currants and all kinds of stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, upcoming events. Do you have any, Sadira? Um, yes, uh, let's see how far away I can see. The Clark County Library is um, going to have in February, uh, and that's here in Las Vegas where I live now, um, a uh, multi-author art fair. And that's going to be on the, oh, it's coming up February 20, no, February 19th. Okay. Uh, if you happen to be in Las Vegas, come see us at the Clark County Library, and it'll be a big old art fair with lots of authors. I have at least two author friends in Las Vegas. I'll make a point of telling oh, them. Very cool. Maybe they'll be there. Yeah. Michael, do you have anything? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Me neither. I've just, you know, I've got my nose to the grindstone. Don't plan any events anymore. So the last question of the evening is... Who's next month? Okay, let me see. Did I make the print big enough or shall I make it easy on myself? Um, we have actually a friend of mine, Alona Peronakova, is an author, diversity and inclusion expert, speaker, founder, and CEO of IP Resilience Global and Identity Guru. She is a descendant of Armenian genocide survivors, and she herself survived wartime in the Republic of Georgia. She experienced ethnic discrimination, including rejection from her grandparents and being denied admission to universities. Undeterred, Alona has earned an award in a beauty pageant, medals in a marathon and a triathlon, and degrees in business administration and ministry. She's on her way to earning a PhD. She has been featured on Fox, NBC, CB, CBC, and in several magazines, including Forbes. As a master coach, Alona helps people find their voice, their courage, and self-confidence to achieve happiness even in life's darkest times. Alona will be talking to us about her memoir and inspirational books. Um, her first book, her memoir that she put out is called Opium of the Almond Tree. And then she's actually put out, I think, 10 or more books probably in the last year or so. Um, a lot of kind of inspirational, um, what you might call self-help, encouragement, that sort of thing. And a cookbook too, is something about berries. So that should be very interesting. That sounds really interesting. Uh, so thank you, Sadira, for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much. Fun. I really enjoyed your readings. Um, this has been Books and Brews, episode 35. Uh, please 34. join us again next month. Or 34. 34. Yeah. Join us again next month for episode 35. So thank Cheers. you for joining for tuning in. Cheers. Cheers.